Four Dominican sisters and three Jesuits, two priests and one brother, were shot on that night. So we're sitting in this place where three of our companions, Father Martin Thomas, Father Christopher Shepherd Smith, and Brother John Conway, together with some Dominican sisters, were murdered in cold blood, a point blank range. One of the sisters, Sister Seslaus, we had been together in Zambia. And I knew her somewhere, somewhere in Zambia. It's way back as 1972. When I saw her in Musami, when I arrived that Sunday, I said, Sister Seslaus, what are you doing here? And she was she had a gloomy face. And she says, Fidelis, I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm really afraid. And she's one of those who was gunned down. But they were not fighting anyone. They were not causing trouble. They were killed because they were doing what they believed God had asked them to do in this part of the world. They did not run away. Yes, as I said, I warned them. Despite the fact that they knew how dangerous it was, it was their deep faith in God that they wanted to remain committed to their duties and to their folks, to their people whom they looked after. They didn't want to leave them alone. None of those guys were we are hard, hard guys, tough talkers or anything, no. They were really ordinary. The Jesuits at Musambi were aware. Uh, one or two of them who were later shot, killed, um, did mention, they, 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 they sort of sensed that something was going to happen. Um, they will come for us just as we are, he said that. And um, he, he made a joke of it. He said, I'm going to escape disguised as a nun. But at any rate, um, I think they were all quite unprepared when uh, uh, the guerrillas did actually come. Who those guerrillas were, to this day, there's not a consensus about it. Some say it was government uh, troops disguised as guerrillas. Others say it really was a, a group of guerrillas, but not that it wasn't the policy. I think everybody's agreed it was certainly not the policy of the Zandler forces uh, to uh, kill missionaries or, or even Zipra. Because, but but you had these 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 elements in the uh, in the liberation movements which um, took matters into their own hands. And I knew that they were not freedom fighters. I knew that the war had not yet gone to Musami, because I was heavily involved. The Rubicon was Gezi River, that's where they stopped. And they said, for us to reach Musami, that's, that's, that's it's only 72 kilometers into the city, into the capital. But this group, that bunch which came, was all black Salu scouts. At any rate, 
a group of them arrived at the mission on the 6th of February 1977. And, you know, there's a kind of a whole story about it, how they went around and gathered eight missionaries and lined them up on a certain place on the main path there. Four of them were sisters, four of them were Jesuits. And um, then they, they, they shot them, just cold blood. They just lined them up for execution, as it were. Seven out of the eight died on the spot. Um, well, the one who survived, a Jesuit priest, Father Dunstan Masco, lived for another eight or nine years. I mean, he, he, he wasn't wounded at all. And so we had to listen to the news about the massacre of, um, of our sisters and the Jesuits, which was really hard for us to take, and we could not travel because also there was petrol rationing, we got coupons, and so we rarely could travel 500 kilometers from Silveira to Harar. And of course we commonly refer to people like these as martyrs because they died on account of remaining faithful to their faith. It seems to me that one of the things that we can take away from this sad and tragic experience is the generosity that these people had. They were missionaries, came to this part of the world. They were living and working in very uh, dangerous times during the war, but that did not deter them from you know, carrying out what they understood as the will of God, carrying out the, uh, the mission of preaching the gospel to the people of this area. We were part of them. So you wouldn't leave a family who is in trouble. So no matter what the trouble was, we said, now if we also go, where will the people go and find medical help? I mean, we'd been in the country a hundred years and, um, you know, uh, this was the first time something like this had happened. We'd never been, nobody had ever been killed before, in the, in, a, in the whole missionary um, endeavor in this country. But each one, I would say, to their best ability, carried out their mission for which they were called, in good and bad times. You know, these three Jesuits who died together with four Dominican sisters also speak to us on the importance of collaborating in God's mission. Today, the Society of Jesus is placing a high premium on collaboration and networking to carry out the mission of God. In many places where the Society of Jesus arrived first to proclaim the word of God, they came together with others. It could be sisters or it could be other people or other religious groups. So collaboration is part of our DNA. It's not something that we can avoid. It's not an option, but it's part and parcel of our response to uh, the faith, the mission of the Society of Jesus, which in our day and time is you know, expressed in different ways. But I would imagine that in this part of the world, providing social services like schools and hospitals, working for the development of the different countries we live in, working for social justice, you know, these are things we cannot do on our own or accomplish on our own. These are things that we need to come together with our partners in mission to collaborate, to share responsibilities and ultimately to share in our mission. Well, there were three other incidents. I think the first was Gussie Donovan. His name was Desmond Donovan. Uh, he, um, uh, he, he had started his life in St. Aidan's, our college in Grahamstown, and he was superior at Musambi for a, number, for a number of years. But he was a, a no-nonsense kind of man, and um, uh, people always remember that uh, when 
the local people, when their pigs or their cattle strayed into the mission compound, and especially the mission garden, and destroyed, he got furious and really shouted at people, and, 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 uh, and he threatened to shoot the pig. There's no way we can definitively link that to what happened to him eventually, because he was transferred after some years to Makumbi. And Gassi, uh, one Sunday morning, um, went out to visit sick people and give them sacrament of the sick, and you know, I think he said mass somewhere. Uh, but uh, he was um, attacked that morning and killed, and his motorbike was found, but his body was never found. He had on his program mass, which was going to celebrate with um, a family where there was um, a sick man who had gone to anoint there. And I think it was out of that uh, place where he was uh, pulled out by um, his uh, killers who are not uh, at the moment uh, perhaps known. And there was for a long time we thought at Silvera House that he was still alive, but he'd been taken to Mozambique because some, some of our people had actually been abducted and taken to Mozambique. Brother Herman Toma and some of the sisters from Marymount had been taken to Mozambique. John Dove was asked by the provincial Henry Wardale to go and meet Mugabe uh, and ask him about Gussie. And so John Dove went over to London to see him and he met him and Mugabe was terribly warm to him and greeted him and so on. But he said, I know nothing about this, nothing. Can you tell me more? Tell me all the details. So John Dove did and Mugabe said, I, I'll get back to you. But there was, no, there was no feedback. There was no closure on it. So in Chishawasha, you'll find he has a grave, but there's no body. It's the only grave in Chishawasha without a body. There's just some earth in the coffin from the place where they think he was murdered, he was killed. In Magondi, there were two Jesuits there, two German Jesuits, a brother and a priest. I'm one of those who has based here since 1976, when the 1978 episode happened to take place, that is the uh, death of Father Richard and brother uh, Bernard Reason. Listen was, was the oldest person killed, he was 68. Um, and they were working away quietly in Magondi. There's a whole story about Magondi mission and, and so on. Uh, the situation was not really tense as such. We were quite happy. People here with our priests and their sisters. And that episode was not something that we were we, we are looking forward to. It was something that was strange on that day. So it was on the 27th of June, 1978, that the killing of the two happened to take place. Because two visitors happened to come along, two gentlemen. Uh, they passed through the hospital. Sister Rufaro, anyway, was eloquent in Debele. Those two gentlemen were now speaking in Debele. So these happened to be zebras. What they wanted was money. So they demanded money from Father Richard. It was on a Tuesday. And Father said, it's a Tuesday today. Normally we collect something on Sundays. And after collecting something on Sundays, we normally bank that, uh, that uh, whatever that we collect. And so that today, on a Tuesday, we have nothing really to, to offer you. So it was an insult to those uh, two gentlemen. He was by the entrance of his office. They shot him, and with what that one shot, he, he died instantly. Brother too, brother, Bernard Leeson, was coming down from the uh, a, a, a sort of an uphill where he used to stay, where his house was. He was coming down, but he didn't know that there was danger down there. 
he, he proceeded to come down because normally every now and then he used to come to his garage and as soon as when he was there, they also shot him and he died instantly. Sister Bonifacia with me and Sister Faro, we then went down there to the priest's house and we had to get blankets in order to carry them. And the German provincial had planned to come out. He was planning to come out to visit the Germans from his province who were working here. And uh, so he, he, he moved, he gave a very moving little speech at the graveside in Chishawasha where he said, I, I came out here to meet Rickards and here I meet him now in the grave. Horst Ulbrich was the superior of the Germans at that time and he gave a homily in which he, he said, we must learn to be patient and to forgive and to be understanding and, and all that kind of thing. He tried to pour oil on troubled waters. And the finally, uh, Jerry Pieper was killed in Kangairi, in, in the Mount Darwin area. Um, it's now a, it's, it, the mission was abandoned after that and uh, it's to this day is simply an outstation. There are all sorts of stories that float around that he was too welcoming. He would welcome the guerrillas, but he'd also welcome the security forces if they came through and he'd say, sit down and have a drink sort of thing. And, and uh, that's, people suspect that his fraternization with the security forces as well as his, um, uh, was part of the reason why he was killed, but he was, he was, they came to kill him, there's no question. So for me, what amazes me uh, with um, uh, the judges of that time is their courage to remain in the mission or uh, in the missions, while the, it was very clear that uh, at that point in time, the war was now really waging, and uh, not only waging, but uh, it was now even brutal in many places where uh, the heavy war had taken uh, place and they, they remained uh, in the mission with the people uh, to save the people of God. The ugliness of war, which I think by all means as a Jesuit or as a Jesuit, uh, as a Jesuit today, I feel that it is also my, my work to always work for peace.